Welcome, John. Uh, as you may know, the Society is producing a historical archive, mm -hmm. and it's our uh, duty to uh, present pioneers like yourself in this archive, and uh, we look forward to chatting with you today. Okay, thank you. Um, in uh, 1967, on December 3rd, uh, the first human heart transplant was performed yeah. in uh, Cape Town. Yeah. And I understand you were still a little impressionable medical student then. Um, well, I wasn't that little, but I was still impressionable. <laughs> Tell us about that. What, what, what did you feel when? Uh, well, I don't when think that, I don't think at that stage I was in, interested in heart surgery particularly, mm -hmm. uh, but I do remember that I was president of a medical society in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and we had Barnard come over and visit us. Yeah. And he uh, he gave a very interesting talk. He was slightly more interested in who he was going to meet afterwards for dinner, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, it was okay. It was, a, it was an interesting time. I think it meant more, <clears throat> more after, after I'd gone to Stanford and after I'd met Shumway, and I understood exactly the, the, the conflicts and the problems of that. But you know, uh, people today struggle. Medical students um, are always yeah. struggling with career decisions. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I'm sure, I mean, was there an aha moment for you that you decided to go into cardiothoracic surgery? I mean, um, what, was that, was that a, what well, was the know, turning point? Well, you know, if you interview anybody, <laughs> all right, and they say to you, I've always wanted to be a heart doctor since I left school, you go, <laughs> oh, geez, I don't want to know, you know, yeah. really, seriously. Yeah. And I think what you do is we all go down little little niches of, 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 of energy from the top of the mountain down. And you go down the valleys, you can't get back. <laughs> and so you go down them. And I think probably I sort of knew that I wanted to do heart surgery when I worked as an RMO actually in the Holly Street Clinic when Donald Ross was there. Yeah. And Magdi was yeah. the registrar, and Terence yeah. was a registrar. Yeah. And uh, I saw a bit of heart surgery there and thought this was, this was quite fun. Well, so that's when I really did it. And, and actually my wife, was a nurse from New Zealand there, so it was all a very interesting time. So t tell me what, what led to your uh, career in moving to Stanford for training. You know, tell us about those uh, days. That was all. Well, Philip Caves, mm -hmm. as you know, uh, who was involved in developing um, the biopsy and, and, and biopsies with Margaret Billingham, uh, was over in Edinburgh as a consultant, then went over to Glasgow as a professor of cardiac surgery, he's a very young man. Mm. And the whole plan was for me, probably at that stage, to do transplantation and pediatrics. Thank God I didn't do both. And then, as you know, age, what, 37, he dropped dead in the squash court. Yeah. And I mean, how did that influence you? That, that you, oh, you knew Philip oh, Caves and, huge, huge. and his sudden death well, must have been quite... Uh, various odd things about that. I mean, this, is, this could take a longer time. Go than ahead, you think. go ahead. The, the, we, we'd operated on we'd operated on a a, a, a child in um, the sick children's hospital, and we would he put a, he put a, it was a very complicated problem. It was, a, it was a young adolescent, and he got into real trouble. And I was in the other hospital, and he phoned me, and I arrived there, and there he is covered in blood with a, with a registrar who didn't know what to do, with oh a pump, so with the pump connected the wrong way around. Oh my. Uh, and we got this kid off bypass, and he was having angina through that operation. We didn't know that, age 37. And then I get a phone call a few weeks later to say that he just dropped dead. And so I said, well, okay, where is he? Is he in the OR? I was, a re I, was a, I was a junior resident. So I said, well, I'll go and see if we can do something about this. And he was obviously dead. And then I just felt really odd. And I, I, I nearly gave up medicine completely. Um, really? Yeah. And so I did some very strange things. He was left-handed, so I took all the left-handed instruments off the, off the uh, trays, and I still have some of them. And I thought, well, what are, what are the essential talents of, uh, of what we were doing? And it was making the right decision on the wrong information very fast. So I thought, well, I'll go to the stock exchange, because that <laughs> seems a sensible place to go. Anyway, so that was a, it was a real big shock, because he had a lot of people's careers in his hands at that time. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people changed. And so I phoned Norman Shumway and said, look, Phil is dead. And he was absolutely devastated. And at that stage, it was already halfway through me going there anyway on a fellowship. And so that obviously got firmed up. Um, and but Philip himself nearly left surgery to become a minister. He was a very religious guy. Is that right? But the lesson it taught you, and, and it's really important for everybody in, in, in whatever, whatever you do, mm -hmm. it taught you that nobody's indispensable. Well, there's this 37-year-old guy. Everybody's career in his hands. He dies. 
and we all continue on doing something different, and we all continue to do something else. Mm -hmm. So when everybody, anybody says to me they're that important, you just say, no, we're not. And, and, and that's been very useful for my career because I've never felt that, you know, they can't do this without me. They may do it differently without me. They may not do it the way I want it done, yeah. but, you know, you're not indispensable. And that's a very important lesson. And that matters now when I've given up a lot of things and I'm about to retire. So I've actually done succession planning, so there's not a big hole. I haven't left, I hope I haven't left a hole where only I can do things. So that was a lesson from Phil. Well, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And of course, uh, you know, the, the history of development of cardiac transplantation and, and yeah. heart and lung transplant was emerging at Stanford around the time yeah. you were there. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us a little bit about uh, what did you go through, you know, uh, when you met Norm Shumway and when you, <laughs> when you worked at Stanford? Well, give, give us some uh, interesting insights into that. I have, and that's a whole longer story. But... Um, <laughs> As you know, Norm and I had a very long-term and, yeah. and, and, and unique relationship yeah. for a variety of odd reasons. Maybe our brains were in a strange odd way. Um, but it was a very exciting time. And I, I went there as a junior resident, and then within a year I was chief resident. Wow. And I was the last guy to be chief resident on the transplant service and the general service mm -hmm. and scheduling all at the same time. Well, it was wow. hard work, but it was fun. What, what do you remember about Norm Shumway, a, a defining thing about him that helped you in your own career, John? Well, I think he, he was not in any... Well, as you, as you know, I, I gave the address after he died at the society. Um, he, was in, he was a very clever guy. He was unpretentious to the extent of being very shy. He was, he was quite a shy person in, in many ways although shy but gregarious in public. It's an odd combination. Um, and he had a great but wicked sense of humor. He got away with things that the PC world would not let you do these days. Um, but he, he instilled fun and he said, he said that, you know, cardiac surgery is, is probably the best job in the world because you get paid for having fun. But also the other things are, he said it's changed because when he started, uh, you don't, we weren't sure whether the patient was gonna leave the operating room alive. And now, I mean, that's not just with transplantation, now you're expecting it to happen. But I think Ed Stinson probably said the best things about Shumway. Mm -hmm. And he, he said that the reason why Dr. Shumway is so good is because he always makes the right decision on the wrong information. <laughs> and that's, you think that's why you have doctors. Sure. If, you, if, you didn't, if you didn't have, if, if it was all an algorithm, you could press a button, you wouldn't need mm -hmm. you and me. Mm -hmm. Well, very good point. I mean, that's a big learning statement mm. for youngsters uh, today, you know, yeah. because they're, they're being pushed more and more into algorithmic uh, medicine and protocolized medicine, but uh, it's just the way of our times. So, uh, you know, you were at Stanford with Bruce Wrights and yeah. Norm Shumway when the first heart-lung transplant yeah. Yeah. in the world was performed yeah. uh, right there uh, yeah. you, with you being part of that team. What was that like? Well, um, it, was, it was a very interesting time. I'll, t I'll tell you the great stories about that. We, mm -hmm. we had the, the donor uh, actually came from San Diego. And uh, I came down here and picked the donor up in, 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 the, in, the, in the jet. Did you really? Bruce was in Las Vegas. Oh, uh, wow. doing something, at a, yeah. at a talk. Yeah. So we flew over to Las Vegas to pick Bruce up in the same jet. Right. So we, we arrive at Las Vegas, and I don't know whether you've ever been to the, the VIP airport there, but we park the jet right outside the doors. <laughs> Out comes Bruce, and we thought there's some film star. He's just good old Bruce. Get in the jet, fly, fly by, and do the operation. And uh, uh, Phil Oya did the donor operation, and I helped with... Uh, Norm, the reception operation. And um, we then got in a bit of trouble because we flew a body across state lines because we went from California to Nevada with this That's <laughs> right. body. <laughs> but it was not, you know, not dead, there's a body, you see what I mean. Anyway, and then, and then it was great fun. And there are lots of stories about, about what happened after That's that. That's great. And then, of course, I'll tell you, you one, but you, can't, but you can't put it in the thing, but I'll tell you the story. <laughs> I'll hear it uh, no, later. No, I'll tell it. You're going to tell it? It's up to you to decide. <laughs> so we had this big, huge, lovely guy called Jesse, who was one of the theater orderlies. Yeah. And uh, Jesse says to Shumway at the end of the case, he says, gee, Dr. Shumway, you're pretty sure of yourself. And so Norm says, why, Jesse? He says, well, you know, straight from monkeys to white folk. <laughs> 
That was Shumway. <laughs> that was Shumway. Well, that's a great story. That's a great story. True story. So then, you know, you finished your training uh, and, and uh, you got a post at Papworth. Yeah. So how, how, how did that happen? I mean, what, what made you go to Papworth? Well, I think Terence had started heart transplants. Just tell me about that. You know, you met uh, Sir well, Terence the, well, the English. Well, the whole thing was, well, the whole thing was that Phil Caves was supposed to start transplants in right. Scotland. When he died, yeah. Terence, I think, decided he would do that. And, and he's a very single-minded sort of person. And then he started. And then very shortly after that, Maggie started in Harefield. And I had a conversation with him before I left yeah. about where to go. And I had conversations with various people. And then the job was sort of came up. And David Cooper and I were interviewed. And the rest is history. That's great. So let's fast forward to 1984. And yeah. uh, here's this uh, Brenda Barber. Brenda Barber. Yeah. yeah. Um, the first heart-lung transplant in Europe. Uh, you know, a pioneering success. Well, he's the first one to survive. First there, one there, to survive. There's been a few others before. But it's first Good one point. To survive. So, so you, you know, you of course are credited with doing that. The first heart lung transplant in Europe that survived, and uh, and uh, certainly that's a pioneering attempt. But to move the field from a structure like Stanford to a new infrastructure. What was it like? What, what did it take? How long did it take to assemble the team? You know, what was well, it like in those well, days? The, everybody had a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we were doing heart transplants. We were doing maybe 10, 12 a year, not very many, but increasing. Yeah. We started using cyclosporin because, as you know, we gave sure. the first cyclosporin in Stanford. And that, that was another story because I remember giving the first dose of cyclosporin. It's 1982. First dose to a yeah. heart transplant fish. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're obviously going to start doing heart lungs, and we've got to get some funding and permission and all the rest of it. Maggie did a couple of people that died. Uh, and at that stage, remember, we couldn't move the organs. We had to move the whole, the whole body. So we, we had to get that organized. So, we so you weren't doing distant um, procurement. I, I was then. the first to do distant procurement as well after that. So tell us about that. So, so initially, so the donor had to be brought to the hospital. site of the transplant. Yeah, yeah. If, like heart transplant used to sure. be. Heart transplant sure. at Stanford used to be that you move, I mean, half sure. the time I was there, you move the donor, but then there was no distant procurement because cardioplegia wasn't used regularly at that stage. Right. And so the, for heart lung transplantation, we moved the donor. And then a few years later, maybe a couple of years later, we did the first distant procurement. So how did you organize the team? I mean, did you. Well, there's, a, there's already a team there, there's already a yeah. team of junior doctors, there's already yeah. um, uh, an infrastructure of coordinators. So you just make you know you, you you make sure the protocols are right. You you go through the whole issue about what we're going to do, how we're going to pick the patient, sure. um, and so on and so forth. And and as always happens, you know you get the donor when you you know I I had a streaming cold, so I ended up with a mask full of gunk at the end of this operation. <laughs> but it it it, it was um, it was interesting, and she uh, she did well. She lived 11 years after that. Is that right? Yeah. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. What did she die of? Uh, she died of a combination, I think, of, 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 of OB and coronary disease. Mm. Yeah. You know, Jack Copeland just um, uh, reported on a 25-year-plus survival of yeah. uh, a heart-lung transplant. Yeah, I've got one. Very good, Julie Bennett. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. In fact, we had a 25th anniversary two years ago, yeah. and at that meeting we had five people who were over over 24 years. John, with your experience in this, have you figured out why uh, some people live 25 years after a heart-lung transplant? Is it just luck, you think? Uh, plain old luck? Uh, what, what does it take? Well, come on, you know, you know that, that a third of the patients will do well whatever you do, a third will do terribly well, and the middle third we fight for. Yep. So uh, I, I think we took a lot of care of those patients. We had no biopsies. We didn't do any lung biopsies for the first patients. Mm. So we didn't have any way of detecting rejection. And in fact, when we first started doing heart lung transplants, we used to do biopsies of the heart as a surrogate for lung rejection. Now, we now know that's not the case, but that's how we did it. Um, so we didn't have any biopsies. And in fact, Tim Higginbottom started doing biopsies with uh, a bronchoscope in the patients. And we were terrified when he started doing that. And you won't remember, but we used to give papers here about number and number and numbers of, of biopsies and specimens. So Amazing. we actually started doing transbronchial biopsies as well. 
So, so in 1984, you'll do the first heart-lung transplant that yeah. survives, and then a year later, you decide to uh, do a heart-lung and liver. Yeah. One, uh, what, one, what, one, what were the circumstances of that? Well, I think we'd done a few heart-lungs, and uh, there were some patients who had combined disease. Either they had lung problems, that the patient we did actually had lung problems secondary to, to biliary problems. But, they, 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 but then, of course, we did something the group of cystics. And we, because Roy Kahn was a big liver transplanter in, in, in Cambridge, mm -hmm. we decided we'd look at patients for heart, lung, and liver transplants. And uh, we had this suitable patient, and we did her. And at that stage, we did, I remember doing a case that we'd done in our hospital. And uh, we put the liver in and then the heart lung in and had to anastomose the IBC. And I thought, this is silly. Why don't we just keep the whole lot together and <laughs> cut down the diaphragm? So we, we did that on the next few cases. Is that right? That's great. Yeah. Have you kept up since then? Have you done a lot of triple uh, organ transplants? No, we've done a few. But then, but then what happened was that up until that stage, the liver world had an excess of livers. Mm -hmm. And now, like, like ourselves, they've got a, a, a shortage of livers for sure. the demand. Sure. And they felt that the results weren't sufficiently good. So as they would think of wasting a liver, now I'm not entirely sure I agree with that philosophy, um, but given the difficulties of the, just doing routine heart and lung transplantation, I mean heart and lungs separately or together, it's, it's, there's just not enough organs to go around to, for those one or two patients who really can benefit from it. But it's an interesting operation. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's technically no, very challenging. Nothing left. <laughs> nothing left. So let's um, let's move forward to the early 1990s, and you know by then you were uh, thinking of this lack of donors and how to expand the donor pool, oh, and yeah, xenotransplantation, yeah, early, early and on, yeah. your affiliation with David White perhaps yeah. uh, seeded this uh, notion of research around xenogenic transplantation. And mm -hmm. tell us how how how, how the, the whole process of that research outlay evolved in. In, in your mind, in your group's mind. Okay, well, I, you know, like all, like all, th some things in science, they all begin in a in a in in, in a in a bar. So, I was sitting there with one of my neighbors, who was a, nothing to do with medicine at all. Yeah. And he was just saying, well, why, why, why do you have this problem with organs? And I said, well, you know. And he said, well, why don't you use pig organs? And I felt like saying, oh, you know, okay, fine. <laughs> And I, then, I, I, then we were thinking about what, 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 is, what is essentially pigness? What makes a pig a pig, a zebra a zebra, a man a man, and all the rest of it? And so we, we embarked down this thing, and I recruited David. And then we started looking at a variety of things. And then we started looking at complement. And then we decided that probably one of the most important things was the way the, the human complement system, which is well, complement species specific, works. And that we'd, we'd somehow genetically modify that. We actually made genetically modified mice and then mm. pigs at a time before, remember, before PCR became a really central sure. technique. So we were, we were doing that and, and then we managed to make a gen genetically modified pig that actually at that stage prevented acute rejection. And I still think xenotransplantation is going to be a future, but as Shumri said, it, it uh, has a great future and always will be. And always know? will be. <laughs> but I'm not sure that's right because I think that there's a lot to be said for for thinking of genetically modified animals for transplantation. And we got bogged down in the issues of prions and, 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 and retroviruses, which was, which is bad. What about... Um, we, got very, we got very close. Did you? What about the non-scientific, uh, more regulatory and more ethical aspects of it, animal lobbyists? Well, you know, they, they, they exist. And the, 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 the ethics in the, are different from the morals. but. You know, if you have the concept of a ham sandwich, then using a, a pig for a life-saving operation isn't, isn't difficult. And, but I think what happened was we had a combination of, of um, BSE in cows in, in the UK, and then people got very frightened of viruses. Sure. And regulatory authorities got tighter and tighter. If we'd have done this 34 years ago, we'd have just done it, put it into some human, and we probably would have had a survivor. But the, the science would have gone on faster. I mean, there are still big problems with xenotransplantation. I don't think anybody should suggest there aren't, but no. there are no more bigger problems than there are with stem cell therapies. Of course. Now, do you regret the fact that you retired without doing a xeno in, in a human model? Um, regret? Okay. It would have been nice to have made it work. Sure. But having thought it and having known the basic thinking to do it and having got some basic 
work out of it. And the fact that that industry or that scientific industry is still going on isn't, isn't too bad. It would have been good to have done it, but then I, I, I don't regret it. I mean, you, you yeah. can, if, you, if you start doing that, if you start doing that, you retire um, hurt or you retire um, <laughs> uh, not in the right frame of mind. You, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to quit saying, I've done that, yeah. and I don't need to do it again. So, so, I mean, do you think that it might still happen? Yeah. Do you think we'll get there? Yeah. What would you another. say is the biggest challenge right now? I think there needs to be some new thinking. I think everybody's keeping batting against the same wall. And as you come into something new, you go over to hurdles, mm -hmm. and then you hit this big hurdle um, with blood clotting and blood, blood interaction. Mm -hmm. but also with antibodies. And they keep trying to go over the top of this hurdle. Mm -hmm. I think you should go in underneath it. Mm. You know, some, there needs to be some new thinking. And there needs to be a world that will accept taking that sort of science ahead. And, but at the moment, everybody's distracted by, by, by particularly stem cell technology. I mean, 10 years ago, you'd have thought stem cells were going to cure the world. Well, mm -hmm. have they? No, not yet. Will they? They might in some, they might. But, but I put it to you that I've got, a, I've got a grandson, and I used to show a slide of three-month-old grandchild and I, at a stem cell meeting, and I'd say, look, this, this, um, this, this little baby that they all go, ah, oh, the girls, you know, it was made out of a stem cell by two people with no knowledge of biology <laughs> in nine months, <laughs> all right? And you can't produce a sheet of cells that squirt out insulin in response to sugar. Yeah. You've got a lot to learn. Oh, of course. Of and course. so I think all these technologies are complementary rather than rather than trying to, to, to exclude one or one or the sure. other. And the same goes as you're going to talk about, about, about mechanical devices. I don't see, I've never seen mechanical devices as being, taking anything over. They're going to be right for some people and not for others. And well, I'm glad you brought up the issue of well, mechanical saves devices. You a sentence. So, you know, this is all happening in the 1990s. You know, yeah. Zeno is, yeah. is, is being looked at by your yeah. group and others. Yeah. And around that same time, the field of mechanical circulatory support in a fairly nascent way is emerging. Yeah. So t tell us, you know, I mean, uh, you were initially quite skeptical about it. Uh, where, no, where, where I, I, I was, uh, no, not at all. I, 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 you got to listen to what I said. Okay. Okay. People used to give papers about the mechanical devices and say this is going to improve the number of transplants. Ah. Mm -hmm. Now it just is no way ever going to improve the number of transplants. And QED has it improved the number of transplants? Mm -hmm. All it did at that stage was to make them cost more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Now for an individual, it might be very worthwhile if you're in mm -hmm. bad heart failure to get mm -hmm. you better to be transplanted. Mm -hmm. But let's not kid ourselves. What we were doing at that stage was using people with heart failure as a test bed for the devices. Sure. That everybody said we're going to be self-sufficient and working and you wouldn't need anything else 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't matter how much you bleat and say, mm -hmm. they're still not good enough for your routine everyday use. Yep. And all they do is increase the expense of transplantation rather than the number of transplants. Mm -hmm. now, on the back of that, I was more than happy to say that people should develop devices because, my, because I think the outcome for devices isn't what we do now. I think the outcome of devices is taking to build class two or three heart failure and you know, you guys putting them in percutaneously and you just give somebody 500 cc's a liter extra cardiac output mm -hmm. and they're gonna be well, like pacemakers. That's where devices are gonna make a lot of money. So you think that the future for mechanical circulatory support is bright but but more and more in the less sicker patient and more and more well, in the... it depends what we're trying to do. If you, if you, if you look at heart, heart transplantation, we've mm -hmm. done, what, 50,000 heart transplants at in least. the world? Yeah. Well, how, many, how many young men died on the first day of the Battle of the Somme? 50,000. Sure. So in, in, medic, in, in, in affecting, in doing medicine for a community or for, for, for a group of people, we're not actually doing a great deal, although we've done a lot of things that the periphery comes off. Mm -hmm. But we're not actually producing a lot of medical care for a large number of people with heart failure, lung failure, and so on. And we never will unless we break out into other things. Now, devices might help that, but they're still not there as a standard therapy. But that's not to say you shouldn't try. Look at pacemakers. They used to be this big, and now they're standard for little old ladies, and they do well. Sure. So devices will be the same. You know, I think the devices will become smaller and smaller. Yeah, uh, and sadly put in by yeah. cardiologists. Well, sadly. <laughs> um, and, and, and these devices will provide lesser and lesser support, but perhaps more 
capability to reverse the, the disease state. Do you, do you ever see... Well, it'll, 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 do, it'll do more for more people who've got moderate heart failure, who are going to be benefit more. I mean, if, we, if you do what we do, which is work it right at the end stage of, of our disease processes, so we help a few people, but the impact yeah. in terms of health care mm -hmm. is very small. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking at the impact of health care, then putting devices in earlier to people, same way we used to do sure. valves. We used to put aortic valves in people who were really sick. Now we put them to people before they get sick. Of course. So in the same way, that'll happen with devices. And heart failure is the biggest killer in our, in our Western world. Sure. I mean, or, or biggest killer of mortality. Yeah. Forget cancer. Yeah. Heart failure is much bigger yeah, burden. By, by much bigger burden. Yeah, by 2030, we yeah. anticipate 20 million people with incident heart failure. 20 million. I hope I'm alive to have to be there. <laughs> now, do you think? Do you think this notion of recovery is real? Uh, you know, I mean. I, I look. Look. Listen. I think some people will recover whatever you do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And either they've had a viral whatever, or, or or they haven't quite stretched the heart up too far. And if you start putting devices into people early, mm -hmm. like putting a, an aortic valve into somebody early before they stretch their heart up, they will recover. Sure. Or they may get a better exercise tolerance for longer. Sure. Whether you can generally say that you're going to get a class of people with heart failure, put devices in, and they're all going to recover, I think it's a bit far-fetched. Because actually now, if that was the case, there's now sufficient experience for people to say, hey, look, more than half these people get better, and we can take it out and yeah. they go home. But now, yeah. apart from one or two groups, yeah. does that happen? No. Right, you're okay. Right. Yeah. QED. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, you know, let's, let's go to uh, seeking a perspective from you. So, you know, you've watched the field. Yeah. And things are happening in the UK mm. where, where we're seeing a decline in the number of transplants. Even mechanical circulatory support is not really growing at an enormous pace. What's happening? What, what's changing I, and, I, and I, what's the future? Okay, of I think it's a very complicated business. The first thing is that it's, it's, it's got through being pioneering. So the, 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 the enthusiasts who are there uh, and who are young and vital aren't necessarily there. Heart surgery particularly is, 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 is not so much emergency anymore. So the guys don't get any, they just get a lot of hard work, n no fame, no fortune. Uh, and, the bar and the barriers are pushing it out of less. The number of donors have gone down for very good reasons. You know, we've got better seatbelt laws, better drink driving laws, uh, better treatment of hypertension, um, better treatment of stroke. And we don't have single gunshot wound to the head in the UK. Is that have. right? Well, very, very rarely. People don't carry guns, so we don't have that. So the, there's a good reason. But, but I think the other thing is that people become very risk averse. So everybody's looking carefully at the results. And like here, um, there's a bit, I think clinical governance is very good, but there comes a time when it is still a business where you have to have the courage to fail. So people are becoming very um, risk averse. Mm -hmm. The population of surgeons is older. Over, over half of surgeons in the UK in heart transplants are over the age of 55. Mm. So you've got to have sustainability. So the important thing is back to where I was, Philip Caves. You've got to begin your succession planning early. You can't wait till Dr. X leaves or drops dead. You've got to start early. And so in the UK, as you know, we restrict the number of transplant centers to about five or six. And it should be probably three. So there's going to be a big review of that soon anyway. So mm. it, it, it's a very complicated problem, sustainability. So, you know, you alluded to this issue of a succession plan and, yeah. and the vibrancy in the field. And, yeah. and so it, let's segue for a moment into training, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, how you see the field of training. I mean, I'm sure that you've mentored some great people in your time. And can you speak to that? Now, how do you see mentorship today in okay. cardiothoracic surgery well, what, in the field? What we've done, we've, 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 we've worked out what our manpower needs are for the next 10 years, as near as you can, because it's not a science. And we reckon we need about 15 new surgeons. So we've got two uh, dedicated um, post-training or post, nearly post-training fellowships in the UK to train people specifically in transplantation. Mm -hmm. And so that hopefully there will be a, a stream of young people who are keen and interested. But we recognize it's a young man's game. I mean, people, as you will know, as you get over the age of 55, it doesn't matter how enthusiastic you are, you just can't be up all night and work the next sure. day. Sure. And you shouldn't. And and it's always, it's, always, it's always too easy to find a good reason to turn a heart down. 
So how are we going to motivate young people today? You know, what, what would well, your you, advice you, be to there's them? There's a variety of things. You can, you, can, you, can, you can have it understood that they, they're only going to be in this for a short while. You can keep their motivation up by saying you're only on a transplant service every six months, so you have you know, people competing for results. You can do all sorts of things. You can pay them a bit, pay them differently or pay them a bit more, depending on what country you're in. Um, uh, and also, I think the thing is that we're no longer doing heart and lung transplants. We're doing heart and lung failure surgery. Sure. So it's not just transplants, as yeah. you know. And it's not just so surgery. It's, 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 it's combining with um, pacing, mm -hmm. dual chamber pacing, and all hybrid. the rest. Of it. Hybrid. It's a hybrid. Yeah. So the whole business of treating organ failure isn't just the surgery. We use, these as, we use this as a short-term short phrase for training these people to use devices, to use lungs, to work out yeah. different systems. Yeah. Yeah. So John, in, in conclusion, uh, leave us with some parting thoughts. Uh, what, oh my God. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> you know, what advice do you have? You know, if you were speaking to a youngster who's just going into cardiothoracic surgery, what would you say to inspire them? Uh, you know, what, what advice would you have for the I, field? I th well, cardiac surgery. I, I think the, one, oh, I don't know what happens here, but one of the problems we've had in surgery is that people specialize too early. So they don't get to see lots of different sorts of surgery, and therefore they don't choose what they want to do. I think if they want to do cardiac surgery, they've got to have, they've got to have some fun. If they're not having fun, and they're finding it hard work, don't do it. It's not going to be that. You've got to accept it's going to be hard work for a while. There's new things going to happen. And although you may look at it from, they may look at it from their end saying it's all been done. And we may start saying like old men, oh, it's all been done and what you're doing now. There's always new things to do. Just look in the last five years, the, the way that putting valves in is changing. Oh, sure. And that's hybrid. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I think that you should enthuse them um, they are often the brightest of the bright in surgery, that they, and I think they should be encouraged uh, and, and travel, not just stay in one place, go and see other things. So that's good advice. Uh, yeah, and the reason to travel is to always learn something new from a new place. Mm -hmm. Often when you travel, you, you, you actually um, get comforted by the fact that what you're doing is, is, quite is, good. is okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, thanks for sharing your uh, comments with us, and uh, right. it's a treat to interview you. Thanks Thank again. You. Thanks. Take care.